I am Captain Junior Soto from the 86th Vehicle Rennes Squadron, Ramstein Air Base, Germany. I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. McCauley. Dr. Janelle McCauley is a combat veteran who served 20 years in the U.S. Air Force as a pilot, commander, special operations consultant, and professionalism instructor. She is the co-founder of Warriors Edge and was the first leader to introduce mindfulness as a proactive performance strategy within the U.S. military. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. McCauley. Let me take you back a few years to a dusty outpost in the middle of the western desert of Afghanistan. In that intense moment, I had to rely on my tactical training to get the job done. Is this a risk I could really afford and was even willing to take? Hard work and training of craft are only part of the equation. We must get command of our mind. As humans, there's only three things that we can train. Our craft, our body, and our mind. We're pursuing our best. It guides everything that we do. Not many days in my life feel like that night in Afghanistan. But when I do feel stressed or overwhelmed, my personal philosophy my God, no. Now more than ever is the perfect time to introduce mindset training skills to populations that put their lives on the line for others. I'm going to pull back the curtain and show you how the best in the world and those organizations condition their mind to thrive, to flourish in the present moment, even when the stakes are Welcome to Warrior's Edge. Hello, everybody. I am so excited to be here with you at the Logistics Officer Association Conference. It is just my pleasure to spend this next session with you discussing Warrior's Edge, which is a high performance uh, program that will help you get command of your mind and also elevate your performance. And really what we're talking about is, you know, when we are going after life, right, when we're trying to get the most out of it, when we're pushing the boundaries on what we're capable of as human beings, do we feel prepared for that? And so if I were to ask you a question, and this is honest, right, this whole session is going to be a self-reflective journey. So I want you to be honest with yourself here. And I want you to truly think about, like, do you want to be a badass in life? Right? Like really think about that. Do you want to slide into home base knowing that you put everything on the line, that you really tried to be your best? And I'm talking about professionally and personally, whether that's as a parent, as a spouse, as a leader, or as a technical expert. And I think most of us, if we really looked at the core of who we are, we would really understand that that's what we're after, right? We're after not just doing things media in a, in a space of mediocrity. We really want to be our best selves. But in today's ever-changing world, right, that is unprecedented or these unconventional circumstances that we're in, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we are prepared for any adversity or challenge that we may face? Now, many of you, right, joined the service just to do that, to see what you can do, to serve others, to give back to your community, to give back to your country. And that takes a lot of sacrifice. It takes a lot of ourselves. And what I found across the space of those that I've interacted with over a 20 year military career and then beyond consulting and working with military and high stress occupational teams is that we do it because we feel a calling, right? And we want to really put ourselves in those positions where we can do great things, right? We can do difficult things and we can thrive. And this is what I found in the space of human performance is that we can train three things as human beings. We can train our body, we can train our craft, and we can train our mind. Now, if I were to ask you, where have you spent the most significant portion of your training time in the service and in the military, which one of those three would make sense to you, right? Many of us understand training of craft, and that's because we spend a significant amount of time training to be technical experts, whether that's being a maintainer, whether that's as a logistician, whatever your focused area is, transportation, support, we are going to train you and in a focused way to be your best in that occupation. We also, in the military, we understand training our bodies, right? It is necessary for us to have physical activity because we know that it supports our ability to be high performing. So those two aspects, right, we got that. But when I ask you about training your mind, that might seem a little foreign, foreign to some of you, especially if I asked, have you trained your mind in a very formalized way? Now, that's something that I think we can no longer just leave on the table, right? If we want to truly be 
high performing, if we want to be prepared to be badasses and kick ass in this adventure we call life, especially as we put ourselves in high stress and rugged environments, right, which is what the military does, right, we are not just expected to do our jobs when everything is is great. We are expected and, and in easy. We are expected to do our jobs when things are not right in those combat environments, in those spaces where it is unpredictable, where it is stressful. And so if we don't train equally our body, our craft and our mind, we are not taking advantage of our true potential to be our best. Now, where does a lot of this research come from? I have studied the people who are the best in the world at what they do. They push the boundaries and the envelope on what is what they're capable of as human beings. And what we found is that there is a common threat, right? They train their bodies in a world-class way. They train their craft to be prepared for whatever circumstances and environment they're in. But they also train their mind so that they can have clarity and creativity when the pressure's on. Because here's the thing, almost everybody these days is really good at what they do. But what makes the difference is can you command your mind when the pressure's on? Can you do difficult and amazing things, right, when it really counts? When in our job and in our occupation, when lives are on the line, can you do that? And are you prepared? And I would argue if you haven't invested in the space of training your mind in a formal way, you're missing out on the ability to be as prepared as you possibly can for these environments. And that's what we found, whether it's Kerry Walsh Jennings, whether it's Kobe Bryant, um, LeBron James, any of these high elite athletes from Tom Brady to even Aaron Rodgers have recently said that training their mind has been a critical aspect of their ability to be high performing. Because here's what training our mind does for us. It helps us live more in the moment. And when we live in the moment, that is where greatness happens. That is where we can execute our performance in a world-class way. So are you prepared to do your job to the best of your ability. Now, I know that I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story because we all have stories about how we came across the space where we found necessity in training our minds, right? All these elite athletes have stories, even CEOs that are finding that they've hit burnout and they're finding that the aspect of getting command of their mind has significantly changed the way they live their lives. So that's my challenge to you to take this session where we are going to talk about training your mind with an open mind, right? And self-reflect on what you can do better in your life to potentially see the world around you and see your stress in a different way so that it actually can benefit you instead of hinder you. And I know that that is a tough and challenging space to go to. And that's because of my personal story. I spent 20 years in the Air Force. And for all intents and purposes, if you would have looked at me about 13 years into my career, you would have thought, gosh, she has everything going for her, right? She's got a career and she's a leader and she's doing well in the Air Force. She's getting promoted, doing all the things she needs to do to set herself up for success, as well as having a family and a military spouse. My husband actually was a maintenance officer. So we were kind of bridging that maintenance and ops gap during our career. But I actually found myself in this space where I looked around one day and I realized that I had, I had forgotten how to laugh. And I lost sight of all the love that was right in front of me. And I was so busy trying to be perfect at every single thing that I did. I forgot that there was growth and learning within my imperfections. I actually completely lost myself. And I don't know if many of you are in that same space or you feel you're approaching it or you see your peers around you or even the people you lead. They are also facing these challenges because here's the thing. Most of us go through life inside our heads, listening to the stories we tell ourselves. And most of the time we make deals with ourselves. That sounds something like, well, as soon as I finish this degree, I will finally start taking care of myself. As soon as I finish this command position or this big project or tasker, I will finally start paying attention to my family. Now, what happens in the course of achieving these milestones is that you get to one and then there's another one right behind it. So then you make another deal with yourself and you say, well, as soon as this next thing is done, in the meantime, you are just 
living your life stressful moment to stressful moment and not really being present. And I know for me, that was kind of manifesting itself in this complete burnout, right? Hitting a brick wall thinking, I can't stay in this hustle any longer and I cannot find any joy in my life. In fact, even when I had some of the biggest successes, I was so worried about what was coming next. I couldn't even enjoy the moments when they happened. And maybe you can sense this, right? If we really self-reflect on our own journey, maybe we can see that we struggle with this and, and definitely we can see it in our peers and our, and the people that, that are our fellow leaders and those that um, uh, are on our teams. So what can we do about it? Well, as I mentioned, when we train these three things and we fill the gap that exists where we don't formally train our mind, it can be life-changing. We can see our world in a new and different way. Now, how do we do this? This is my partnership. When I went back to school after my burnout and I really realized that I was missing this idea of training my mind, I wanted to partner with the best for my coach to really focus and fine tune what you're gonna hear today, the warrior's edge um, mindset training. Now, our goal is to help people find their best selves no matter the environment, because we know stress and adversity, they are not going anywhere anytime soon. So how about we help equip you to be prepared for facing those challenges and those environments? So that's really what mindset training is about. Now, a lot of people will say, Dr. McCauley teaches these soft skills to the military. Here's the thing, the mindset training, they're not soft skills. They're actually very difficult skills. I'm talking about cultivating self-awareness, emotional regulation, the ability to live more present and focused, live with clarity and creativity. That is a difficult and hard thing for most of us to do because stress and overwhelm really can do a number on our ability to stay present, our ability to be a high performer, especially in moments where it counts. And so we're going to train you or teach you the first steps on how to train your mind to better prepare you for any environment. Now, how do we do that? We've actually, through two lenses, that of scientific research and evidence-based practices in alpha, and testing in alpha competitive environments, we have determined that there are 16 principles of mindset. So 16 things that you can train your mind, right? And what I'm talking about is not just learning about the science, which we will do, but then finding a way to execute and train them every single day in a very formal way. Instead of making it something that you just think about or you do every once in a while, this becomes a real formalized practice. And that's the best way to really get command of your mindset. Now, I like to say the majority of the catastrophes you will experience in your lifetime will only happen inside your head, but they will feel very real because that is how powerful our minds are. In fact, our minds are fantastic. Uh, our full potential for high performance. It really comes down to really focusing and training on these principles of mindset. So everything from mindfulness, which I think is a, the foundational skill for getting command of your mind, as well as the recovery principles of how we think, how we move, how we eat, how we sleep, the psychological framework, which means this is basically how we see the world around us, which is anchored in grit, control, and optimism, as well as the mindset skills of calm, confidence, focus, and trust, right? Do you trust yourself and do you have the confidence to actually step into those arenas and find your best self. And then that center piece, which is our self-discovery. This is where I'm asking you to really self-reflect on who you are, not just about what uniform you wear and what job you have, but who you are at your core. I think that is something that the military significantly struggles with, right? We get tied to our job profession, to wearing a uniform, to being ha having a rank, right? And being a member of this military team, which is so vitally important to execute the warfighter role. But what happens when we take those uniforms off? When we transition out of the military, whether that's retirement or separation, when we transition from a deployed environment back at home, if you don't know some of these really deep answers on what your personal philosophy is, what is important to you, what makes you you, right, you're going to kind of struggle in life. And that's where I found myself in that course of my military career, right? There were many times that I just got tied to this identity that was, that I was a pilot and I was in the Air Force and that that was 
um, what made me me instead of letting the doing flow from the being, right? We have to understand who we are and then let the doing follow, but we sometimes do it backwards. So a whole bunch of discussion points and training really goes to figuring out, right? That self-discovery piece and, and, and who we are. And that's something that I noticed when I was in the Air Force, many people struggled with. We never really ask someone like, you know, tell me who you are. We say, tell me what you do. And so that it's just redefining the narrative and the language around how we mentor right those around us both on our teams and those that are um, in our families because i'm going to talk about both because i think they're so vitally important so these are kind of the the concepts that the program is really um based in now if i ask you if physical exercise benefits or physical activity i think everyone understands that in fact um here's the fun fact about physical exercise and i love to use this meme from anchorman you know i believe it's jogging or jogging it might be a soft j now when there was a time maybe 50 years ago that if you were to ask or you were to tell someone, hey, I'm going to go for a run, they would have said, why is someone chasing you? And it would have seemed really strange to actually say, I'm going to go out for a jog or a run. It just wasn't really a thing we did as, a, as society. Now, when scientists started to look into the concept of physical exercise, right, they actually determined, hey, this is, this is good for us, right? When we move our bodies, it does a whole bunch of great things for us. It improves our flexibility, our agility, our strength, our endurance, changes our body uh, mass. It can actually get our brains firing better. So when the scientists kind of came in and started looking at it, everybody started to do it. It became part of our social norms in our society. In fact, this is the cover of People Magazine from 1977, right? Jogging, it was the new craze and everybody started doing it. But right, as I mentioned, this was not always a common thing. So I'm trying to make the analogy that if you're kind of thinking mental skills training, this sounds a little skeptical. I'm not really sure about it. Here's what happened with physical exercise, right? It went through the same evolution and a journey. And I think we're just at the same moment in life where in the 1950s and 60s, people were sitting too much, right? We stopped laboring, we stopped moving our bodies and the military actually realized that. In fact, running and jogging was started in the United States Air Force by Dr. Ken Cooper, who was a flight surgeon. And he was tasked by the Air Force to get astronauts into space and fighter pilots to pull G's because we were not physically fit enough to do so. So physical activity came out of military necessity and started in the Air Force. I think we have the same opportunity here with mental skills. Right? How many of you have maybe watched the, the Social Dilemma on Netflix? Right, It's a documentary that really discusses our digital devices and in particular social media, how it's giving us this dopamine addiction, how we are becoming so tied to this, you know, our new reality that's in a virtual world instead of really connecting right on that real level with people that are in our real lives and the things that are happening right in front of us. So it is taking away, it's highly distracted, distracting and taking us away from being in the present moment. So I think now more than ever, we need an antidote to that, right? We need to continue this evolution where we start to actually formally train our minds because we know we need to, to stay on the cutting edge of our ability to be the best Air Force, to be the best military in the entire world. So what do I mean by getting that warrior's edge mindset? What does that give you, right? What does form, formally training your mind, what, what do we get as the end result? Well, what we're really building is psychological flexibility. What happens when our bodies and our brains are faced with stress and adversity, which again, I told you that, that that's what our world is full of, that's not going away anytime soon. When we're faced with that, our brains go into survival mode. And when we're in survival mode, we are operating from this space where we are just in our stress response, right? We are trying to make rapid, more emotional than rational decisions. Now, when we build up psychological flexibility, that means that we've front loaded with these mental skills that can actually help our brains not just survive when we're faced with stress and adversity, but thrive. It helps us stay in a rational space for making decisions, for us not to choose 
maladaptive coping, like substance abuse or um, uh, high risk behaviors when we're faced with those challenges. And I know many of our young airmen today are, are sympathetically activated, right? They like that uh, stress response. And when they have to stop and relax because they've never been trained how to do so, right, it can be very challenging, right? They're going to go in that survival mode, which is where we make poor decisions and with respect to how we lead our lives and ultimately perform. So we want to build that psychological flexibility, which is increases our cognitive capacity, right? Our ability to make those rational decisions. It builds mental strength so that we can be exposed to psychological and emotional trauma and actually bounce forward from it. Build that res mental resiliency, right? So that we can be better for having experienced those those sessions that really at times might have had failure and stress associated with it, but that also can equal growth. And ultimately, we want to build a pathway to sustainable high performance. I think one of the common issues we have in the military today is that we can only be in this hustle, right, and the deployment and the do more with less for so long until we hit those brick walls. I know that most of us, after the about 10 to 12 year point in the military, we are physically, emotionally, right, mentally exhausted. It's and craft to make you an exceptional badass kick-ass warfighter. But what we also need to do when we fill that gap and train our minds, we can ensure that we can do this for the longer term, right? We can sustain these, this level of high performance because we realize that stress plus rest actually equals growth. So it integrates that restful space and it integrates our ability to get outside of our stressors and the overwhelm and actually more into the moment. All right, so to really explain this, it helps if we start by discussing our system of attention. Now, I want you to think of your attention system like a flashlight. It can be laser focused at whatever is most prominent in your conscious experience. So what is going on in front of you? It can also be laser focused internally. We can be focused on our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions. In fact, some of our psychological disorders happen when that flashlight gets a little haywire. Maybe it gets stuck internally. And so we can't see our way into the moment, into get, getting perspective on what's happening in our lives. Maybe our flashlight flips back and forth too quickly. Right? These types of issues with our attention system can hinder our ability to be high performing and it causes what I like to call cognitive elaboration, right? That storytelling. Have you ever, say, sent an email to someone and maybe they didn't respond back right away and immediately you tell yourself a story about why they didn't respond and almost nine times out of 10, you are assuming best intent for yourself, but not for the other person, right? Automatically, you make up a story about, oh, they're angry with me or they're mad because I used caps or, oh, I should be worried about something or um, why are they ignoring me? And you go into a whole narrative around this one email. In fact, it may dominate your thought patterns for the entire day. Day. In fact, even into the next day when you wake up, you're going to start thinking or regretting or ruminating over that one email, right? Because that's what our, our minds do. They anchor on these types of stories and they keep kind of repeating them and going back to them, especially if you allow that attention system to go internally and start focusing on just those thoughts and feelings and emotions instead of being outward and in the moment. Now, our attention system is especially fragile. So it tends to kind of turn and flip inward when we are around stress. And again, that's because what stress does to us is it puts us into survival mode. And when we haven't built up those psychological skill sets, it becomes very easy to let ourselves go internally and start to listen to these stories that actually have no root in the reality we are living, right? But again, remember I said our minds are fantastic at mental time travel, so they will feel very real to us. So what do I mean by stress, right? I know a lot of people always say, oh, Dr. McCauley is going to take away my stress. This is going to be so great. Here's the thing about stress. Stress is actually a perceived emotion. So it is your interpretation of how you are interacting with your environment. We actually have complete control over our stress. There's actually good stress and bad stress, although I know most of the time it, it feels like most of the stress is bad for us. And that also has to do with how we've trained our mind, right, to adjust and adapt to stress. Now, 
Here's what we call the Yerksey Dodson law, and it's a curve that puts activation against performance. And what we can see is that on the left side of the curve, when we start to get activated, our stress response starts to go off. We feel some of those physiological symptoms, butterflies in our stomach, our heart starts racing a little bit, right? Maybe our palms sweat. That side of the curve is called U stress, EU stress. And that's stress to get your edge. That's the good stuff. But here's what most of us think when we start to feel those physiological symptoms, we start to think, oh my gosh, I'm super nervous. This moment is too big for me. I can't do whatever I'm being asked to do. And then we get so overactivated that we fall into the other side of the curve, which is called distress. Now, this is not the place where we make rational decisions. In fact, we almost always make emotional overreactions when we're in distress. And a lot of times we almost feel out of control, like our thoughts are just our thoughts and they're driving these behaviors without our ability to stop them, to separate from them, and to actually be in the moment and gain perspective and awareness as what, of what is even happening. In fact, I guarantee you could probably remember a moment in your life where you did something in distress. Maybe you sent off an email or a text to someone, you yelled it, maybe a family member, you punched a wall, you honked your horn, right? We've all been in those moments. We almost feel like, almost immediately after, why did I just do that? I didn't mean for that to get out of control. That's what distressed us. Now, just think about this. What if when we started feeling those physiological symptoms of stress and we were in eustress, we told ourselves, you know what this means? These sensations mean that I'm about to do something that's important to me. I'm about to do something that I care about and my body is telling me I'm ready. Right? Just the simple act of changing the narrative, right? Of being more aware that even those sensations are happening, right? And then choosing a different path forward, right? That can keep us in new stress instead of sending us off that deep end into distress. But that takes training, right? It takes focus and it takes a formal way to really train our minds for those moments. And it's so vitally important how we can kind of change what's happening in those scenarios. Now, one other aspect of this curve is this dotted line here, and that is called the razor's edge. And that's really what warrior's edge is, is really meant to do. It's meant to help all of us find that space on this curve where we have the maximum amount of stress to help us perform at our best and no detrimental distress to really degrade our performance. And so we want to, you to find that warrior's edge spot, that razor's edge for yourself. Now, if you've studied ideal brain chemistry, you've probably come across something called flow state. And that's really what we're talking about. How do you get to that optimal space where you are so in the moment, time actually doesn't register. Maybe it stands still for you, or maybe it goes super fast, but it's in those moments where we really are at our best as individuals. Now it's fleeting. It's not an easy space to find, which is why it takes work, which is why it takes training, which is why elite athletes are in search of that razor's edge. But I think it should not be just just reserved to the elite athlete. I think what we do, where lives are on the line, where things are so vitally important, we should be able to find that, that warrior's edge space for ourselves as well. Now, it can be very difficult. I told you our minds like this um, mental time travel uh, genius. So we can kind of think of our minds like an iPod, right? Instead of thinking and fast forward and worrying about the future, thinking and rewind and ruminating, ruminating on the past, what if we just sat on the play button? What if we trained our minds to be more on the play button? Right? It can be a very difficult thing for us to, a uh, different difficult space for us to find, but I guarantee you that's where greatness happens. Now, it can be difficult because of this concept called mind wandering. So our attention system, remember, it's that flashlight. When it flips inward many times, it can happen unintentionally. Now, we've all read a page in a book, right? And you got to the bottom of the page and you thought, I don't even remember what I just read. Or maybe you drove your car somewhere and you realized, you know what? I can't even remember what roads I took to get here. That was because you were mind wandering. Now, what I mean by mind wandering is having an unintentional or off task thought during an ongoing task or activity. I am trying to focus on reading the book or driving my car. My mind takes me elsewhere. And in fact, the research will tell us that that happens. 46.9% of your waking moments, you are not paying attention to what's going on right in front of you. And what we've also found with the research is that 
when that happens, when we have these off task thoughts, we tend to think toward the negative, right? We have unhappy, unpleasant thoughts, right? When our mind wanders, it rarely wanders to some amazing vacation you have coming up, right? It's going to mind wander to all the things you have to do before you leave on vacation, or maybe even all the things you know is going to be left for you when you get back. So even when you're out there on vacation, instead of being in the moment, instead of enjoying time with your family, you're going to constantly be mind wandering about all these worries, all these ruminations over what may or may not have happened in the past or all these catastrophes you're going to build about the future, right? So this is a very real concept. In fact, there was a moment where I was with my son, um, Andrew, he was three years old and I was giving him a bath and I was a commander at the time. And so maybe some of you have um, positions right now where inside your head, you make deals, right? That whole like, oh, I'll take care of myself at this point. Well, I told myself and the story was that I am going to be home every night for bath time and bedtime with my kids, like as much as possible, uh, that is going to be a priority for me. I may not always make dinner because of my job as a commander and leading a team of hundreds of people, but I'm going to make it a priority to be there for bath time and bedtime. And for a while I was doing that. And the narrative inside my head was like, look at what a badass mom and leader and all this stuff that I'm doing. I'm managing it all until one night when my son is this little three-year-old, I'm giving him a bath. He stops me and he put his tiny little hands on my cheeks and he just looked up at me and he said, mommy, why are you so sad? I love you so much, mommy. Right then and there, I realized instead of being present with him, laughing, loving, learning more about him, I was mind wandering and distracted. I was not paying attention to that moment where I could be learning and loving and laughing with one of the most important people in my world. Now, how often have you been with people on your team that you lead, or maybe people in your family, people that are important to you, and you find yourself mind wandering and not paying attention. We've all had it happen. Maybe you've even walked into one of your boss's office offices at some point. And even if you can get them to stop typing on their computer and turn to look at you, sometimes you're telling them something that might be very important, asking for their mentorship or their leadership. And you can tell they're looking at me, but they're not really paying attention. And many times as leaders, we don't intend to do that. I don't think any of us ever says, hey, I want someone that works for me to come into my office and I'm not going to pay attention to them. No, our intent is to pay attention, but our minds, as this research will tell you, are going to be distracted. And it's going to take a lot of training, focus training, for us to get a handle on that so that we can pay attention, so that we can connect with those around us, right? And really create the relationships that we need to be effective leaders and teammates. So this is a very real concept. Now, sometimes I get the question, isn't mind wandering good for us? Isn't that where we find creativity? I would call the, the two separate brain functions of mind wandering means that I'm unintentionally going into my thoughts. I don't want to go there, my mind just goes. Daydreaming is where I will productively go into my thoughts and just let my mind kind of take me to something that might be lead to creativity. Now, you may be doing that, maybe solving a problem, thinking through a solution for something when all of a sudden you find yourself mind wandering and distracted about some stressor or worry. So it can happen, right? We can mind wander when we're trying to actually daydream and be productive. So just remember, there's these two separate brain functions, and we want to get that 46.9% of our day decreased. Now, just just at face value, I want you to think about that. Half your waking moments, you are not paying attention to what's going on in front of you. So if it takes you three hours to say, do a performance report, it actually only takes you an hour and a half. The other hour and a half, you're mind wandering and distracted. Every time your mind goes off task, you have to reconnect, think about where you were, which line on that performance report you were writing, right? That takes away our productivity and our efficiency as individuals. And I don't know about you, but I know as a commander, I didn't have that much time to waste. So if we can get control of this, imagine how much more white space you might actually find in your day. So what is the solution for this amount of mind wandering and all of these things that are really distracting us in today's world? How can we stay on the eustress side of the curve? How can we be more present and live on the play button? Well, really, 
I told you in the space of physical exercise, we had this journey where scientists started researching physical exercise. And now there's hundreds of thousands of published articles to tell us that we need to exercise physically. In this space of mental exercise, there are only hundreds, maybe we're at a couple, you know, getting towards the thousands today. But in that space, good news is I've read all those articles for you. So I'm here to tell you that the most prominent skill set that will help us, right, in a cutting edge way, capture those thoughts to actually live more on the play button is the skill set of mindfulness. Now, it's not just just about being more mindful. It's about doing the training, right, and the work to build up our, our, our awareness and our ability to emotionally regulate and to stay on the eustress side of the curve, especially when we're faced with adversity. This is why mindfulness is the foundational skill set of all the other mindset skills that Warrior's Edge um, mindset um, focuses on is mindfulness is mo most important because it helps us disconnect from the unhealthful, unhealthy thoughts, helps us disconnect from really any kind of non helpful dialogue and that cognitive elaboration, right, that happens inside our head in an unintentional way. So that's why it's the first skill set that we find so important. And I equate it to doing mental push-ups. It's really a way to strengthen that attention system to live more on the play button. Just like none of you would think I can do one push-up like physical push up and then be able to pass my PT test. None of you should think, oh, I practice mindfulness once and then it's this magic bullet, right? That's going to help me stay more aware and emotionally regulated. That is not how it works, right? You have to practice it, which again is why this is a hard skill. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of practice, but I will tell you, it is worth it in the end. In fact, when we talked about how much time, right, your mind wandering, can you imagine getting control of that? getting control of all that wasted time and energy being distracted, especially with how much stress we have in our world today. So mindfulness is, is the skill set that we found in the research to be most effective. Now, what does that research actually say? Well, across the spectrum of mindfulness research, we have found you can heal people's psoriasis and you can improve their relationships and a whole host of things in between, right? From improving sleep quality, decrease in emotional eating. I could go on and on. And I think the reason that it does that is because it addresses the way we make decisions under stress. When we make decisions under stress, we tend to choose poorly. We tend to make that emotional choice. When we get control of that mechanism, control of our stress response, our ability to stay more in new stress, we will make rational decisions that are better for how we need to perform. And so that's why I think across the spectrum, we've had so much great success with uh, mindfulness. So I ask, what might it be able to do for you? Now, before I go any further, I'm gonna show you a short video so you can learn from a whole bunch of different areas what mindfulness and the effects that it has on certain people and different organizations. with the Bulls in the beginning here in Chicago, and then moving on to the Lakers, especially with Kobe Bryant. And you knew you had to create a team. You had to build a team. You know, I, I approached it with mindfulness. Mindfulness. <laughs> you know, I, I approached it with mindfulness. You know, as much as we pump iron and we run to build our strength up, we need to build our mental strength up. It's a practice called mindfulness. And it basically means being aware of your thoughts, physical sensations, and surroundings. Mindfulness is the ability to see what's going on in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Having that balance in our lives, being able to deal with potentially volatile emotional issues without blowing off the handle. So I had always viewed meditation, mindfulness meditation, as only for freaks and weirdos and people who live in a yurt and collect crystals. Meditation is a waste of time, like learning French or kissing after sex. More than 2,000 people from companies like Google, Facebook, and Instagram showed up earlier this year in San Francisco for a mindfulness conference to elite athletes like the Seattle Seahawks. The men and women that I'm able to work with that are the best in the world at what they do for investing in being able to quiet their mind. I'm a colonel in the United States Army. I have 25 years of service. And it wasn't until I started practicing mindfulness myself that I saw how much of my life I was really missing. 
Congressman Tim Ryan, an Ohio Democrat, says mindfulness might look a lot like nothing, but he really believes it can change America for the better. He hosts weekly meditation sessions open to members and staff of both parties. Now shifting the attention, take in the entire body. I've seen it transform classrooms. I've seen it heal veterans. I've seen what it does to individuals who have really high chronic levels of stress and how it has helped their body heal itself. What mindfulness allows us to exercise is the muscle of attention. It helps us build awareness, mental strength, mental stability, mental agility. To go into that rugged environment that's unpredictable, that you have the capacity to adjust fluidly with poise and grace and to do it on time and on point to be able to execute um, the skills that are necessary for high performance. So that last quote by Dr. Gervais, where he says to be able to go into stressful and rugged environments and know that you have the capacity, the psychological flexibility to adjust and still be a high performer, regardless of what's coming at you. He was talking about football players and elite athletes, right? They're on a world-class stage where everyone's watching and they want to do everything in their power to be their best in those moments. Now, he could have been talking about what we do, right? We are expected to go out into hostile and rugged environments and execute our high performance skills and be able to adjust when things don't go our way, which we know, right? The, the uh, plan is great until the first contact with the enemy and then it goes, you know where. So we have to be able to have prepped ourselves, especially by training our minds to be in those environments and adjust fluidly to be like I said, everybody's, everybody's trying to be their best, but what makes that difference is can you command your mindset when things start to not go your way? And what we found from elite athletic circles and evidence-based practices is that these, the best teams today are really integrating this focus on formalized mental skills training. And so we kind of learned a little bit about a few of them in the video, but I'm going to highlight a few that I think are really valuable and important. So I don't know if any of you recognize uh, this team. Uh, these are the New Zealand All Blacks professional rugby team. They actually, in their over 100 year history, were one of the first athletic teams to integrate the idea of formalized mental skills training. They have a few ways of doing that. They have a concept called sweep the shed, which means that everybody, like nobody is above sweeping the shed at the end of the, the practice or the game, right? Everybody is part of the team and everybody, right, can have that humbleness and kind of groundedness in their life. They also have this redhead versus blue head um, ideology, which means that they don't want people on their team to be a redhead. And that means when you're out on the field and something does not go your way, immediately you think, right, you start to get angry, you start to keep repeating whatever just happened. Maybe it was a bad call. Maybe you made a mistake. And instead of being in the moment, right, you're constantly replaying your mistake. And that never bodes well for being in the moment and being a high performer, right? So the All Blacks have some concepts and training methods that they use to build that high performance mindset to live more in the moment. In fact, the Hakka routine that they do before their games, yes, it intimidates their opponents, but more importantly, it gets everybody on the team focused in the moment and ready to live moment by moment instead of moment to stressful moment we're thinking about back into the moment and then back into the problem or the mistake we just made and in the moment, right? They want everyone on the field during the whole game. So that's a way to train their minds to prepare for that. Additionally, you learned a little bit about the Seattle Seahawks. They were the first NFL team under coach Pete Carroll, who had brought some of these concepts from his time at USC about really understanding how to find each individual's best self. So that if every single person on the team is their best self, they lock arms together, they can make an unstoppable uh, team. Now that's something that's kind of unique and different because even in the military, we've come from this GI Joe, right? Everybody gets the same kind of experience and training to this idea that we're realizing that the uniqueness of each individual is really our strength in the military today. And in fact, tapping into that and allowing that whole self-discovery piece of who am I, not just what I do is so valuably important. And that has been at a core of kind of the Seahawks team and their success on how they connect on just a whole different level. 
Additionally, Chicago Cubs, when they finally broke that 108 year losing streak where they won the World Series a few years ago, that exact year was when their coaches asked, not just how can we get our players to hit the ball farther or run faster or throw throw better? They were asking, how do we get our players to do those things in the seventh game of the World Series, right? Because if you can't do these things when the pressure's on, you might as well not be able to do them in these world-class ways, whether that's lives on the line or championships on the line, right? And so they're realizing and understanding that formalized mental skills are the way to do that. And that's when they started and integrated their first ever uh, mental skills training program. And it's becoming more and more prevalent today in various aspects of athletics. And that's why I think that the military, which even has an even more um, important mission, really needs to start focusing on these skill sets and not leaving it into this big gap we have and how we really prepare ourselves in a psychological way for being able to do the things that we need to do. Now, if you think about a basketball player who maybe dribbles the ball, shoots, misses, and then you can kind of see it on their face, like they just can't get back on, in the game. You know, that is what I'm talking about with our attention system. When that intention system goes inward, we keep replaying our mistake. We are not in the moment. We are not being our best. Steph Curry is a great example of someone who will shoot the ball. And half the time, he doesn't even pay attention and watch whether it goes in or not. Now, granted, most of the time it will go in, but he is actually in the next moment, which is ready to respond to what's going to happen next, right? Once the ball leaves his hands, he can no longer control it. So is there any point in those moments to let a dialogue or a narrative inside our heads tie us to whatever outcome is in front of us? No, and in fact, many of us do that. We try to control so much of our external environment instead of flipping it and just trying to control more of our internal environment when in those moments, right, we can continue to be our best selves instead of letting the narratives degrade our ability to be high performing. And so that's the same thing I've experienced as a flight instructor, right? You'd have a student that would do a bad landing and then you'd come back around and they do the, another bad landing and another bad landing. And you knew that it was going to be very difficult for them to snap out of it because their mind and their attention system were, were uh, focused and on this distraction. So where do you live most of your life? What are you paying attention to? And are you even aware of when you're distracted? Because I would argue that's a common problem we have today. So many people aren't even aware that they were mind wandering until they're five pages into the book and realized, gosh, I stopped paying attention a couple pages ago. So this technique and this skill set will help us really bring more awareness sooner and quicker into our lives. You know, there are 86,400 seconds or 1,440 minutes in every day. How often have you let one thing you maybe experienced for 10 seconds or maybe even one minute and you let it change the trajectory of your day or sour your mood? It happens to many of us a lot of times. And so this skill set will help us live more in those that play button to see the spaces in between the stressors and the craziness of our life so that we can see the laughter, the love, and the learning, all the great things that are always there. We just fail to have awareness around them. Now, I would be remiss if I did not, before this session was over, introduce you to what a mindful minute is because it's the introductory way to really learn more about mindfulness. So we're gonna do a mindful minute together. Now, in order to practice mindfulness, do our mental push-ups, we have to anchor on something that's in our present moment. So I like to think of that as our breath, right? It's free, it's always with us, so it's really easy to anchor on. But our breath can be rather nebulous, right? There's a lot of sensations that we're going to experience. So pick a single sensation. Maybe it's the way the air goes in and out of your nostrils. Maybe it's the rise or fall of your belly or chest. Right? Focus on it intently for this entire minute. Now, in the span of a minute, your mind will wonder. You will start thinking about something going on later today or something that happened this morning or just a random thought will pop into your head. And when that happens, the first step, right, because we're training our attention system to hold on that present moment breathing um, uh, sensation, when our mind starts to wander off, our attention system gets distracted, the first step is acknowledging that we're distracted, releasing the thought, and then coming right back to our breathing with a refocus. So that whole idea of getting distracted, 
coming back and to refocus, that is a mental push-up. That is how we're going to strengthen our attention system to live more on the play button. And the more we practice this skill set, the more available it will be to us, especially in those moments when we need it most. All right, you guys ready to try? All right, I ask that you sit in just a comfortable position, maybe keep your hands symmetrical. They can be palms down or palms up, maybe even clasped in front of you. And um, let's take a nice deep inhale and exhale, kind of relax through your shoulders. All right, you can keep your eyes open or closed, whatever is most comfortable to you. If you choose to keep your eyes open, maybe channel your attention down the bridge of your nose to limit any other visual distractions. Ready to begin? And go. and stop. All right. Now, normally, if I had my audience, I would ask how many push-ups you did. So I just want you to think about that. Did you do maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 60 mental push-ups just now? And if you did 60, it's it's okay, right? This is a practice. And in fact, the, what that should indicate to you if you did a lot of push-ups within that minute is that you are a highly distracted person. And so this is a skill set that can help you, right? Get control of that. Now, when I talk about mindfulness and some people saying it's an easy skill, right? Taking deep breaths seems on the surface very easy, but the idea is that we are exercising our attention system. We're training our minds to get more on the play button and we're disconnecting from those thoughts, right? Just because a thought pops into our head does not mean that we have to give it control and focus, right? We can choose better thoughts, right? Choose how to kind of like a, a, a really tap into our emotions in a way that is helpful to us, right? And so this is something that is going to take practice. So if any of you thought like after that minute, I don't feel badass. So that's not the answer, right? Like that one minute is not going to make you a badass. It's the repetitive practice. And where you'll find that it'll be very beneficial is that you've done all the work, right? This is not about, I'm in a stressful moment. I should practice my mental pushups. It's that you've practiced the mental pushups. So that when you're in those stressful moments, you have made a mind body connection so that when your stress response goes off, just as it did when our ancestors were running away from saber tooth tigers, what signaled safety to them when they finally got out of harm's way was that they took one deep exhale. Oh, I'm safe. And that one deep exhale told their mind, you're safe, you can calm down, you can relax. So when you're in that moment, whether you're in a convoy, you're making a big, big decision at work, you're just dealing with kids as you're trying to get out the door in the morning to get to school, or you're dealing with the COVID chaos that's around us on a day-to-day -day basis, if you've trained your mind and you've done this practice in those moments, you feel yourself going into distress, you can take a single deep breath, trigger that relaxation response, that safety, and you can come back into the eustress side of the curve. It can be so powerful for all of us. All right. So these are all the aspects of getting the warrior's edge mindset, but we focused on what I think is the most critical skill, which is mindfulness. That's where we have to start. We have to start with awareness, awareness of what our thoughts, where our thoughts take us, awareness of how our stress response works and how actually you stress and a little bit of those physiological symptoms are good for us and mean that we care and we're doing something meaningful and that we're ready to rise to the challenge. So I want you to start there. It's really start by practicing mindfulness, these mental push-ups, 
find what works best for you. Maybe that's doing 10 to 12 minutes, which is the sweet spot we're talking about with the science a day, but you don't have to do all 10 of those minutes in the morning. You can like mix them up with these mindful minutes throughout your day. I found that I'm such a highly anxious person. By the time I get to two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm already starting to get highly in, in, uh, anxious and into distress pretty regularly. But I found that when I do mindful minutes throughout my day, I can increase my ability to maintain my mindful awareness for longer periods of time. So I want you to find what maybe works for you and in your life. Mindful minutes are great ways to use transition points, especially if you transition from work to home, home to work, one meeting to the next, right? They're a perfect opportunity to just take those deep breaths, get focused, get clarity, and get back on the present moment and outside of some of those negative thought patterns that could actually hinder our ability to be high performing. So mindfulness is really what we anchored on today. Unfortunately, we didn't have time for the rest, but I will um, leave some stuff at the very end of the presentation for how you can access and get more information on the entirety of this, what really is about eight to 10 hours of training. So the model we use today, we use learn, live, lead, right? We described what is, what is, where the gap is, right? Where this gap in psychological performance exists. And we learned the science behind it. And then what are the latest research, the cutting edge research is telling us on how we can actually decrease these distracted mindsets. We can be high, higher performing and really find a pathway to our badass selves for the long term. And then the live piece is how do you train it? Because all of these things you can't just do once. You have to integrate a way to continuously train it in your everyday life to find the benefits. So that's where we talked about doing that mindfulness work. Now, one last thing I want to ask you is, is there an activity in your life that you love? The things that you just take you into the moment that allow you to find that flow state, right? Where you almost feel like, I can't even believe it's been three hours that I've been hiking or I've been biking or I've been fishing or hunting or knitting or coloring, whatever it is. Many of us have those activities, but here's the thing. We treat them like a luxury instead of a necessity. I'm going to ask you to start treating them like a necessity. The time you need to get outdoors, to be grounded, to be connected in a new and different way with yourself and with others can pay dividends and your ability to perform. Now, I know many of you will say, well, I don't have time for that. Well, I just told you that you're wasting half your waking moments being distracted by things that are not contributing to you being your best self. So what if, right, we can get control of that with this work, we can create more white space and ultimately higher performance and more joy in our everyday lives. And then the last thing is how do you lead this? How do you actually make an impact on those around you? That's where it's so vitally important. We have our families at home, we have our teams at work, and we have our communities that are around us. The best thing you can do is be the example. Start to integrate these skill sets and tools so that you can change your life and have other people ask you, how did you do that? How are you the calm in the storm that's going on around us? Right? And you can offer this new perspective and this ability to really understand and start to normalize the idea of formally training our minds to be our best. So that's really what my challenge is for all of you today. How can you lead in every environment? In closing, I want to just ask, what why do we do this? Why do we want to find that badass self? Why do we want to actually give it our all? Why did you join the military to do difficult things, right? Most of us, that's the challenge, right? We want to do difficult things. Why is that important? And why should we be so prepared? I'm going to have you watch this video. This gentleman is going to step off the curb. We're all standing on a curb every single day with uncertainty, with unknowns facing us. Why do we still do it? Why do we still step into challenge and difficulty? Let's watch this video. Did you see what he did there at the end, right? He raised his arms. He was like, yeah, look what I just did. That's why we do it. 
We do it because we want to celebrate, not just with ourselves, right? He turned around to his buddies. We want to celebrate with each other. We want to do difficult things and we love the feeling that occurs after we've done them, right? Because when we stepped off the curb, just like he did, and we step off the curb every single day in our lives, we don't know what's coming. And part of that uncertainty makes what we accomplish even greater. And so to find that badass selves, you're going to have to take risks. You're going to have to do things differently. And you're going to want to be as prepared as you possibly can to find that aspect of greatness in yourself. So are you training body, craft, and mind so that you can step into the unknown, knowing that you've prepared for that risk taking, and then knowing that no matter what happens, you're going to do difficult things. And there's going to be this amazing moment on the other side that you get to share with yourself, with your teammates, both at home and at work. So I want you to focus right on how do I get that, that, that space to find my badass self, knowing that you don't want to leave anything on the table. And so investing and in really training your mind might be a little bit strange, might be something new, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. It has been a pleasure speaking to all of you today. I really um, have enjoyed my time in this session. I'm leaving my email. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at Janelle at JanelleMcCauley.com. Again, I'm also on all the social media platforms. I would love to connect and hear your stories and how you're using mental skills in your life. I also uh, post latest research in the space of human performance. So everything from sleep, which we didn't even get to today, but that's an important aspect of how how we can perform at our best and stay really on that play button, but from sleep to physical activity to mindfulness and, and mindset to also our ability to just, you know, eat and hydrate well so that we can be um, our best selves and best prepared for whatever comes at us. And backslash uh, Warrior's Edge, as well as on my website, JanelleMcCauley.com. And then if you're interested, my partner, Dr. Michael Gervais, all of the stories that we talk about, we have worked with some of the people that are the best in the world at what they do. And he interviews all of them for his Finding Mastery podcast. So at FindingMastery.net, you'll have a whole library of from military operators to CEOs to elite athletes. And really what we unpack are those mental skills that are necessary for them to be their best. Well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your attention today. I know how valuable it is. Um, I would love to help you or any of your teams with any of this get, gaining the warrior's edge mindset. So please reach out. But it's been my pleasure to spend this session with you. I wish you all the best of luck and thank you so much for your service.